The Great Sphinx of Giza is supposed to be settled history. Officially, it was carved around 2500 BCE, during the reign of Pharaoh Khafre, a monument of royal authority staring east into the rising sun. Case closed. Except the stone itself keeps raising a problem, one that refuses to fit neatly into that timeline. Because the Sphinx is not just weathered, it is eroded in a way that doesn't match the desert it sits in today. Look closely at its body and enclosure walls, and you don't see the sharp, angular wear you'd expect from sand and wind. Instead, you see deep, rounded vertical channels, soft, undulating grooves, patterns that resemble runoff, pooling, and sustained exposure to heavy rainfall. And that is where the controversy begins. Egypt has not experienced sustained heavy rainfall for thousands of years. Geologists have known this for decades. The climate data is clear. The Sahara did not become hyper-arid overnight, but by around 3000 BCE, Egypt had already entered a largely dry phase. Wind erosion dominates in such environments, scouring stone horizontally and undercutting it near ground level. The Sphinx, however, tells a different story. Its erosion runs vertically, as if water once poured down its sides again and again. This observation was first pushed into the spotlight by geologist Robert Schoch in the 1990s. His conclusion was not subtle. If the erosion on the Sphinx was caused primarily by rainfall, then the monument must predate the desert, possibly by several thousand years. Potentially as far back as 7,000 to 10,000 BCE, when the region experienced a much wetter climate. That suggestion detonated inside Egyptology. If true, it would mean the Sphinx was already ancient when the pyramids were built. It would imply either a lost phase of Egyptian civilization or a monumental reuse of an older structure by dynastic rulers. Either option disrupts the standard narrative, which is why the claim has never been comfortably absorbed or fully dismissed. The debate hinges on one question. What kind of erosion are we actually seeing? Critics argue the damage can be explained by a combination of wind erosion, salt exfoliation, groundwater seepage, and the poor quality of some limestone layers. The Sphinx is carved from natural rock, not uniform blocks. Softer layers erode faster, creating rounded profiles even without rain. Add thousands of years of temperature shifts, humidity cycles, and occasional flash floods, and the unusual wear may not require a prehistoric monsoon at all. But here is the problem. Wind erosion does not typically carve deep vertical channels across large surfaces. It abrades exposed edges and undercuts weaker zones. Water, especially rainfall running down rock faces, creates precisely the kind of vertical weathering seen in the Sphinx enclosure. And similar patterns appear not only on the statue, but on the surrounding walls that were cut at the same time. That widens the question. The enclosure walls are shielded from sandblasting in ways the statue itself is not. Yet they show the same rounded, water-like erosion. If wind were the primary culprit, those protected surfaces should look different. They do not. Then there is the archaeological context. The Sphinx sits within a carefully planned 4th Dynasty complex, aligned with Khafre's Causeway and Valley Temple. Blocks quarried from the Sphinx enclosure were used in nearby structures, tying the excavation to dynastic construction. That linkage is one of the strongest arguments against an extreme pre-dynastic date. It suggests the Sphinx and its surroundings were carved as part of a single architectural program, unless the builders were reshaping something that already existed. This is where the idea becomes more uncomfortable. There is no inscription inside the Sphinx enclosure stating who built it or when. Attribution to Khafre is circumstantial, based on proximity, alignment, and style. Ancient Egypt normally loved naming its kings. Here, it is silent. Some researchers propose a middle ground. The Sphinx could have been carved, or at least initiated earlier than Khafre, perhaps during a wetter phase at the end of the last ice age, then later restored, reshaped, and absorbed into the fourth dynasty complex. That would explain why the head appears proportionally smaller than the body, as if it were re-carved from an earlier, more eroded form. Restoration is not speculation. We know the Sphinx has been repaired repeatedly across history, blocks added, surfaces reshaped, erosion patched. The monument we see today is not untouched antiquity, it is a palimpsest of interventions layered over deep time. 
Recent work has added new tools to the debate. High-resolution 3D scans, geological mapping, and subsurface studies of the plateau are refining how erosion patterns are measured and compared. Rather than relying on surface impressions alone, researchers can now model how different erosion processes affect limestone over thousands of years. The results have not produced consensus, but they have kept the question alive. And that may be the most telling detail of all. After decades of study, no explanation fully satisfies both geology and archaeology at the same time. Either the erosion looks wrong for the accepted date, or the date fits poorly with the erosion. The Sphinx sits at the fault line between disciplines, where stone refuses to obey the timeline written for it. So is the Sphinx 10,000 years old? There is no definitive proof, no artifact sealed beneath it with a date, no inscription announcing a forgotten civilization. But the erosion evidence does force a harder truth. The monument may be more complicated than its official biography allows. The Sphinx does not need to rewrite history to be unsettling. It only needs to remain ambiguous. Because as long as water-shaped stone stands in the middle of a desert that should never have carved it, the past remains unfinished. And the oldest riddle at Giza is not what the Sphinx represents, but how long it has been watching. The erosion patterns on the Sphinx force us to ask an uncomfortable question. What if Egypt's timeline is longer than we've been willing to accept? And if that's true, then the Great Pyramid may still be guarding parts of that forgotten past. Beneath its stone core lies a sealed shaft no one has reached yet, and that's where the next investigation begins. For centuries, the Great Pyramid has been treated like an open book, mapped, measured, dissected. But there is one place inside this colossal stone mountain that no human being has ever entered. Not a chamber, not a tunnel. A sealed vertical shaft buried so deep in the pyramid's core that modern science can barely detect it. And tonight, we follow the trail of clues that suggests this mysterious shaft may hold the last untouched secret of Khufu's ancient engineers. Picture it. You're standing at the foot of the Great Pyramid just before dawn. The stones glow gold in the rising sun, each block larger than a small car, stacked with impossible precision. But behind this familiar facade lies something far stranger than the world imagines. Because hidden beneath the ascending passages and grand corridors is a void so perfectly straight so unnervingly deliberate that even the researchers who discovered it were left speechless. Our journey begins with a shock. In 2017, the Scan Pyramids mission announced the discovery of a massive unknown void above the Grand Gallery. But that was only the beginning. As techniques improved, muon radiography, microgravity imaging, and new particle detection models, scientists noticed another anomaly. This one wasn't above the gallery. It was below it, a long, narrow, perfectly vertical column of space running down through the blocks, sealed at both ends and hidden behind walls that haven't been touched since the pyramid was built. And here's the part that makes archaeologists shift uncomfortably. The shaft does not align with any known corridor or chamber. It isn't a relieving space. It isn't a structural necessity. It isn't even accessible. It sits like a ghost inside the stone, mathematically straight, intentionally placed and entirely unreachable. So researchers went back to the data. They compared muon tracks, re-ran imaging sequences and published new models in 2023 that refined the shape. And the shape held. A vertical void with clean geometric boundaries about the width of a modern elevator shaft, though far longer and embedded deeper than any exploratory robot can safely reach. Why would the builders carve a vertical shaft no one could enter? Some historians suggest it may be symbolic, perhaps connected to the ancient Egyptian concept of the king's soul traveling to the northern stars. But this shaft doesn't point north. Others propose it's an abandoned construction element, but its precision makes that idea crumble instantly. Nothing inside the Great Pyramid is executed with this level of intentionality unless it served a purpose. Which leads us to the strangest possibility. The shaft may connect to a chamber we still haven't found. 